I, I think what's different is the onslaught of information that is um, taken in front of our eyes uh, all the time. And I always feel like any one of us is is kind of uh, one bad Google search away from some kind of weird rabbit hole. We don't build a hierarchy of who knows uh, or followers or you know commenting. Not the sort of master slave structure of um, of where the internet is today. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm with entrepreneur, futurist, and author Dominic Yarola. Uh, she witnessed Nokia's transformation from a small company into a global household name. Then she assisted numerous organizations in navigating change. A decade later, her focus has shifted to helping organizations make better decisions by truly understanding people's real desires and needs, which I find fascinating. Uh, this led her to establish Hunome, a startup aimed at connecting the dots to foster better understanding. As a founding member, an early board member of the Association of Professional Futurists. Nobody is better equipped than her for this discussion where we talk about the changing world. Dominique, uh, welcome to the show. And uh, first of all, I want you to kick off with your most daring prediction for the future. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. My, my wild prediction for the future is that our democratic decision-making is crumbling. It will crumble under the weight of confusion. But I also see that there's a hope. And what does that crumbling look like? You mean people are misinformed and getting more angry with each other? What, what's the sort of general dynamic here? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the confusion bit has to do with the fact that uh, we don't quite know often what the source is. Of, you know, we see something and we don't know what is valid, what's not valid. We see conflicting information, even research that's conflicting. And um, and then of course there's the the even worse, which is the propaganda disinformation. The you know people with agenda to influence us in a in the wrong way. And I think you know the like all futures, um, this is not a set in stone uh, situation because I think there are many um, people who are working to actually create some uh, better ways to do things. Um, and it depends on all of those people, um, every single one of us, with agency or a role in bringing the future about. So what do we want as humankind and uh, uh, what are we prepared to, to do about it? Um, may maybe one more thing is just that where does this crumbling lead to? Like what's the, uh, what's the potential problem that we'll face if we let it run its, its course in the way in which it's at the moment um, geared to do is that you know, there's an increased uncertainty, um, uh, fear, uh, potentially apathy, um, you know, people not engaging because, you know, they're not quite sure whether they should open their mouths or not, um, and even aggressions, um, which then creates a worse situation for us all. What's different this time? I mean, you, you could argue that when I used to go to the local news agent, you'd look at the different headlines and you'd see a very different reality in, in different publications. What, what makes you think it's different this time and what do we do about that? I think what's different is the onslaught of information that is um, taken in front of our eyes all the time. You know, so we're constantly bombarded with these different things. The other thing that I think has a uh, not, not so great an impact is the algorithmic way in which we might be, you know, sliding down the rabbit hole. And once our minds are set, once we're stuck with a point of view, then, um, you know, it's really, really hard to change your mind, especially if you've declared that this is your opinion. And then, you know, for you to actually, you know, track back and say, well, in fact, I was wrong. And, you know, this is hard for, for human beings, it seems. I think about that declaration of opinion all the time. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm about sort of 45 or so. And um, I, I don't remember people kind of broadcasting opinions in the same way. Like, like I, I felt like we, we consume media and we may have had our, our own thoughts. But these days, almost every global situation, it's almost like we're supposed to have a kind of a press department that issues a statement on behalf of our, our personality where we have to kind of nail our colors to the mast. And, and rarely can it be nuanced. Um, is, is that a real thing? I mean, are normal people, because obviously people like you and I are quite unusual, uh, you know, do normal people feel like they need to have an opinion on things? Are they um, sort of keen to make sure that they can substantiate their opinions? Or is this a sort of tranche of society? Um, I, I, I really have good faith in our ability to express it. It's just that we need to make it um, a comfortable environment uh, for people to do so. 
uh, where we all understand that um, you know we value civility, um, that we value people's points of view, um, that we value the different ways of knowing. Um, there are reasons why that's important, and the disciplines that we come from, and the, ex- the, the life experience that we come from. So it's all about really about um, you know the people who have an interest in. A, understanding how the world works for real, um, and then have potentially an interest in in, in making sure that it works better um, uh, in the future. There is a, a, a group of people that has been defined as cultural creatives. Um, this is not a small group of people. This is actually incredibly large. But I think there isn't a platform or a a mechanism uh, to bring these these you know very well educated, well intentioned, and also people who really w- do want to make a difference in the world. And um, and I think you know it's challenging at the moment to to raise get your voice heard. Basically, how global is this? I mean, I spend most of my time in America, but I also sort of travel a lot to the UK and, and across Europe. And wherever I go, there seems to be distrust in the media. Wherever I go, there seems to be anger at politicians. Wherever I go, society seems somewhat divided. Um, mm-hmm. is, is that a fair reflection on most of the world? Or am, am I just kind of looking at the, the places where things are less uh, serene? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, even Finland, um, you know, where we are just in the middle of presidential elections, Um there are many candidates, um, uh, all of them <laughs> much younger <laughs> than the, the U.S. candidates, um, and um, and and they have really been taken through um, a, an extensive exercise in terms of telling um, you know the the voters as to what it is that's going on in the world and how things are happening and so on. Um, but yet um, we do have that same angry reaction, um, the easy commenting, you know, argu- argumentation without an argument, um, you know, to make and things like that. So it is happening everywhere. But I think um, things can be changed with some new structures for human engagement. And it is global. And um, and it is, um, you know, so so they say the cultural creatives are people who are about 50% of the what's called the developed world. But of course, you have many more in other uh, areas as well. People who are educated, people who understand that there are ways in which we could do things better. Um, and we need to hear that. Um, so EU, for example, has made a recommendation um, that says that all policy work should hear the societal voice better. So getting that kind of mass deliberation um, done uh, better. And that is a great news, I think. Uh, and I hope that there are many, many instances and institutions that take that very seriously. It's always fascinating to me because if um, if someone had told me you know, 30 years ago that the internet would be invented, one would imagine a world which was very informed, um, very connected. I mean, many of the the kind of uh, tenants of, of Nokia, really. Um, yeah. and, and as a result, would be rather empathetic and rather understanding, and we'd all live our life sort of talking about the intricacies with, with a lot of information behind us. But it seems to have gone the opposite way. Mm. Um, so it's obvious, well, it, it doesn't seem to be about the tools. It seems to be about the incentives. Um, mm. Where do you sort of find yourself feeling that the solution can come from? Um, and what would you say sort of Humone's role is in helping sort of make the world a better place by having more informed and nuanced conversations? I think it's true is that I, I think in, you know, 20 years ago when, you know, the first social environments uh, were happening, um, there was a lot of uh, hope, uh, idealism around it to, you know, that this will make the world a better place and, you know, we can all be connected and all of this sort of stuff. But unfortunately... Um, when we allow people to, you know, without any kind of restraint to vent their anger, and the, I think the level of anger has, has increased in the world. Um, I don't think it's just about the underbelly uh, now being shown, but it is about um, the fact that our world has become more complex, um, which has meant that um, often the way in which uh, the decisions that get made uh, they are they come out as slogans, 
you know, so they are like a, a, a rapid way of saying, well, this is, you know, uh, we need to fix this problem and it's a slogan and then you scratch the surface and there may not be a, uh, a really robust, sustainable plan that over time will solve the, you know, structural problems or whatever. And I think this is what then erodes trust in people. Um, you know, in our political decision makers, but it can happen in any any kind of um, you know institution. If we don't take people along to uh, where the decision is and why it is, somehow um, we will have a harder time in this complex world world to argue the case. So no one's going to go into an election um, telling the, the long story about the complex issues and the opportunities and what the vision is. They go in with you know. Uh, vote for me and and, and 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 this slogan will happen. So, you know, but we need spaces where we can hear uh, these different points of view, getting that multidisciplinary understanding about what's really going on in the world. Often we make decisions in a narrow uh, scope where we might take the economic view or we might take the technical view or we might take an aspect, but we don't actually hear the entirety that goes with, um, you know, the different thematics um, that we want to understand uh, better. Do, do you think this is just a kind of a natural consequence of the technology being quite new? I mean, I, I, I find it amazing how angry people get and how they, they seem to sort of enjoy being angry. Um, mm. And I think maybe in the early days of me using social media, you know, sort of winning an argument felt like a sort of victory and it felt like you'd sort of won a computer game or something. And then mm. quite quickly I realized it was just exhausting to be sort of policing mm. the internet and sort of trying to correct people when they were wrong. Um, and I realized it was a much better place just to kind of listen and, and get exposure. So do you think in a way this is also new that in a couple of years' time we'll all have a much more calm response to the internet or do you think these algorithms are sort of hacking away at our sort of brain chemistry and taking advantage of that and 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 the fact that we sort of enjoy sort of fighting somewhat yeah that's a good point i i think you know a long long time ago when uh, <laughs> the mobile phones came out and um, and you know people would pick it up in the theater and and in fact they would answer it's like people had this necessity to answer <laughs> the phone when it rings so people would actually pick it up and speak to it in the middle of a theatre, you know, uh, performance. And so um, I think there is that evolution of our understanding of what's right and what's wrong and how to use these technologies, but they're shifting constantly. So the educational task that we have at hand about how to best get the, the, the right thing out from the technologies is, 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 I don't think it's getting any smaller. Um, it's um, It's growing and that's where, Hunom as well as a as a platform as an as an environment for uh, collective sense making, uh, we have to educate people about um, what's the difference because we're so used to now that you know there's this supposed right way to do things. So you know, twenty years we've been told that you know you you need to behave this way or this is what social media is for or this is what any kind of social environment is for and this is how it works. So then when you do things differently, you get those who supposedly in the know who might lecture you about, you know, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing it this way. You should be doing it that way, which comes from the past innovations. But, you know, 20 years ago when these ideas first formed, um, they were the innovative thing and the exciting, interesting thing. But, you know, we didn't stop innovating. We didn't stop going forward with the kinds of environments that we create, learning from, you know, what became a problem in the in the previous generation and then you know moving on to something um that that now i think is more emphasis is 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 placed on um uh, you know having a purpose and having and doing something that's societally uh meaningful Mm -hmm. and um and helping uh in situations that are problematic in this world and i think this this our democratic decision making is certainly one of those um, so how does Hunome work and how can people who are listening uh, be a part of it? Yeah, so um, Hunome is for individuals, um, groups or even organizations who have a curiosity to understand um, how the world works, to inform others about what they know um, and to build that way a sense of shared understanding, multidimensional understanding, 
multidisciplinary understanding um, that that really then um, you know puts that understanding at the forefront of the decision making that then gets made. Doesn't mean that you know people who who are on you know as individuals building their own understanding or as group who are leading humanity to an understanding. It doesn't mean that decisions get made uh, as a recipe, you know, from that. But we are much more likely to make great decisions if we um, hear the societal voice. Um, it's many perspectives in, you know, when people are arguing well their case, then it might change people's minds as to, you know, what should be done in some thematic area. So, for example, we have um, on Hunom, we have um, some great themes being worked on. And the way in which it has those have come about um, is that some individual um, has a theme that they're keen on, um, and then they kick it off on Hunom. So they basically start this mapping of shared understanding. They mm-hmm. kick it off, and then they invite others to come and join them in the deliberation. So we have, for example, Adam Sharp, who's a futurist, uh, who is working on um, a thematic on population decline. We all know population growth, but in fact, in developed world, the, the big issue is the is population decline. And, and so he's looking into the impacts that will have on many kinds of um, decisions in the world. So he's brought his network along, and now he's looking for more people to come and join that deliberation on you know, the meaning of population decline um, in the world. Then we have um, a, a researcher and systems thinker, uh, Huda Pulabel, who um, kicked off um, a thematic build on um, uh, cancer treatment. Uh, he, you know, she has seen the, or been frustrated about um, the silos that are created around how cancer is treated. And there are many connections in those silos that need to be put together in, into a you know, shared view. And she brought in um, a, a group of people who started to deliberate on that. And now she's looking for more examples of the uh, very complex cases, so difficult cases of cancer and, and, and how um, uh, you know, better treatments could be, could be in place for that. Then we have uh, Professor Nikki Dries, and she is working on um, the unspoken of future of work. So the kinds of things that, you know, do not get raised a lot on the internet, but are a big part of um, the, the way in which we should be thinking about uh, how to put the future system together for um, uh, in the work environment. And so she invited... Is this yep. like a, sorry to interrupt, is this like a sort of a wiki where people are sort of asked to upload information? Is this a kind of debate where people sort of, you know, try to counter each other's perspectives? Is it is it sort of framed as a question and everyone answers the question in their own way? What, what's the sort of mechanism behind it? Yeah, uh, good question. So uh, the mechanism is that, um, well, first of all, it's very creative mechanism, i.e. not no Q&A. Uh, when we when we look at multidimensional thematics, it's very difficult to ask a question and get an answer that's uh, comprehensive to that to that question. So it's not a Q and A, um, and it's not incredibly uh, forcing people to be um, having a ready to go thing. Uh, what it is is that you you walk in as an individual, you kick off what we call a spark map. It, you create what is called a spark, um, the first spark to kick off your build. And it's pretty much like, um, it could be as short as a, as a tweet, effectively. Mm-hmm. But rarely um, uh, people leave it at that. Uh, so then it's like a little bit of a blog post that people create to um, set the scene and say, okay, this is what I'm, I'm, you know, this is a challenge in the world and so on. And the other people who come along to that particular build, um, they connect their thoughts um, into that first spark that was kicked off. And it's really about creating thought connections, trains of thought, and effectively creating a system of thought, uh, you know, once the spark map is very large and there are many people involved. So, so really the important thing for people is to find where, where's the right context for them to add a thought or um, they navigate through that spark map and they're reading different perspectives and they go, hmm, that inspires me. Oh, I just had another thought that's related to what I just read. And then they add a connected thought. And that way we create a mapping 
um, that is on the thematic um, that was, you know, the, the scene setting happens on the first spark. It means that human beings have the right to be creative, have the right to bring in the human ingenuity as to what kinds of things might actually be connected to this particular thematic. So not shoehorning ourselves into kind of an answer uh, or a report straight away, but really allowing the deliberation to happen. And it tends to be more of a not arguing against each other, but building on top of each other. And yes, sometimes it, it is that I'm not agreeing with this what this person said, but then you have to create your, you can't just comment. You actually have to <laughs> create your own perspective. And, um, and, and the more you argue your case well, the more then you can get attention from other people to say that, in fact, yes, you have a point here. And, um, and then, you know, keep adding uh, to that train of thought. So e- each human being and each node, thought node, um, is, is basically at even keel. So mm-hmm. we don't build a hierarchy of who knows uh, or followers or, you know, commenting, not the sort of master-slave structure of, um, of where the internet is today, but smart thinking people coming together to make sense of something and be inspired by the thinking of of others. And is it kind of being done with an aim that companies or governments can access this kind of corpus somehow? And, and how does that work? Do they just sort of get access to a website or do they get access to a, a conversation that's that's built from it? How, how does, yeah. not, not so yeah. much commercially, but in terms of its impact, yeah. how does it work? Yeah. So every, every participant is an individual that takes part in this um, at the moment. So we have a free product out that's, you know, readily available for everyone to take part. And um, I'm really hoping that um, some key institutions whose remit it is to be uh, taking forward a better world that works better for for all of us, Mm -hmm. um, that they come in and they um, engage with other human beings to actually, you know, expose things uh, to people. I I mean, it could be human rights or human responsibilities. What what does it mean to have freedom of speech? Um, You know, it could be all kinds of thematics um, uh, of this nature that these institutions could be building. And it's free. And all it is, is so it's not about coming in and consuming the content of others, but rather it's about participation. Because if you don't participate... Uh, you are not um, an active participant in human deliberation about what's a better way to do things. So it's important to be party to it, not just a browser, so to speak, of other people's point of view. And, um, you know, other than the potential sort of challenges to democracy and and sort of truth, um, what are the key themes that you're seeing for the future? You know, as you kind of wear more of your your futurist hat, um, mm. and in particular things that are quite different to other people, because I'm very aware that whenever you read um, most sort of futurist trends decks, they're they're quite mm. often talking about similar things. Mm. Um, so, what kind of themes are you seeing for the future? They're quite provocative. Well, you know, um, I'm a futurist, but I haven't been practicing futurist thinking for a very long time. So I don't sit with a ready to go list of of things that, you know, other than the, the ones that I see influencing our decision making on Hunom and how should we put Hunom together in such a way that it helps where it can. So, you know, complexity I mentioned already um, it's not a foe, uh, you know. It's just that we need to we need to understand what's at stake, what the impact might be on, you know, what decisions we make. And like you mentioned, trust is an is an element there influencing. So this whole idea of how we influence others, um, it's gone up. So now it's also programmatic, and that can be problematic when we have people and or agendas uh, that sit between us. Um, and, the, and the reality of the of the world, and you know, and 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 then down we go back to the rabbit hole, and even worse, worse, you know, we believe educated people believe in amazing conspiracy theories, um, uh, and 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 that's dangerous, uh, dangerous sometimes to people's lives, you know. Yeah, I'm always um I'm always fascinated by conspiracy theories actually, because uh-huh. I think it's it's quite easy to be. Um, quite dismissive of the type Mm. of people who take part in those things. And I I Mm. often think it comes about from people with incredible research skills and incredible curiosity. Um, Mm. And I always feel like any one of us is is kind of uh, one bad Google search away from some kind of weird rabbit hole. 
And when there's almost an, an infinite amount of information that's out there, you can create a sort of data supported case to almost believe anything that you want. Um, so I, I'm always aware that people should probably um, try and channel that energy more than fighting it sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, the way you talk about these things, and maybe it's your kind of your finished demeanor, but you, you sound a little bit pessimistic about the future. <laughs> um, if, if it's not too sort of broad, I mean, are you, are you sort of optimistic about the way that things are going or a little disappointed or? Well, I'm 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 working very hard to make a difference. <laughs> so I'm optimistic. Um, I'm optimistic in that sense. Um, but the fact is that nothing great happens unless we humankind want it to happen. And mm-hmm. so you know, it, it can be like fighting the windmill sometimes. Uh, you know, in in taking your agenda forward in the world that is so noisy and um, and um, loud. You know. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, so so no, I'm not. I can't. I can't say that I'm uh, that I'm pessimistic. That would be giving up and you know <laughs> sitting back and enjoying life. Uh, but I'd rather fight uh, for the for the good directions. Uh, and and when you talk about um, sort of democracy, I mean that sounds like a conversation about politics and leadership. Mm. Um, do you mean it sort of broadly within that domain or are you talking more about sort of divided societies and a sense that the future seems somewhat um, ambiguous and there, there aren't many people providing sort of clear leadership, whether it's business mm. leadership or cultural leadership or, or more of a, a governance conversation? Mm. Um, mm. Are, are you sort of more focused on the political, um, you know, mm. voting side of it or just a more general feeling of malaise? Yeah, yeah. No, it's more about uh, building an informed decision uh-huh. uh, together with others who know something about that particular thematic. Um, and the more multidimensional, more multidisciplinary, the better the, the information. So having created scenarios, the best scenarios happen when you really do have representation from different parts of our way, our human way of knowing things, um, you know, whether it's philosophy or sociology or ethnography, uh, the technical side, the economic side, you know, the many views into things. And the, 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 the better the, the representation, then the better the outcome of a scenario build. And so for, from there emanates uh, what, what our, you know, uh, product Hunom uh, delivers. So it's, it's about uh, for the deliver, deliberation to deliver, it requires that informed citizens and contributors and structures um, hear the societal voice. So it is not a voting, a voting environment at all. Uh, it's really creative. It's it allows people to really express, uh, you know, their perspective. And the point is that it's in thought connection. So I'm connecting my thought to another thought, which we then can all look at. And because I think at the end of the day, the the problem becomes that when the actual path to how the decision was formed is not at all seen by people. So people can't actually follow, oh, I, I see how this went from here to there, uh, you know, what what caused it to happen. So this environment of mass deliberation then makes it transparent and open as to how did people come to that conclusion? What was their argument? What are they saying about what they need more of and less of um, in the world? Or what does the researcher say when they're saying that their research is, is delivering this result? And then you've got another researcher that is saying that, well, they did you know, another research in the same space and have a different result. So how do you reconcile those that you allow people to express the argument and you allow others to come and um, add their perspectives to that. So people might have, you know, they might have an experience that has something to do with the space of the research, which then allows the researcher to get more, you know, footing around what the research is saying, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, in, in the world, human beings know in different ways. Uh, so we might be like a, a, um, a big idea generator, we might be incredibly opinionated, but if our opinions are well argued, um, there's nothing wrong with having opinions or being opinionated. Um, but it is a certain kind of information. Um, people have experiences, and those experiences might be if there's only one in the world, it's a blip in the ocean and it's an anecdote. But when there are you know thousands of that same, it starts to become 
really important and something to seriously take, you know, pay attention to. And often time-wise, if you think about the kind of ways in which we know, um, which, by the way, is all incredibly welcome on here, you know, we need it all. Uh, but the ways in which we know is that the, it's the ideas and the experiences and things like that that come first. Mm -hmm. And then once there's enough of that, uh, then comes research. So we need to be mindful and aware of uh, what is shifting, Mm -hmm. you know, because our understanding doesn't end. It just isn't, there isn't an end goal here. (laughs) There there is just a continual evolution that um, gets better and better, takes the change happening around us into consideration. And all of this gets added into a thematic build on, you know, by many people working together to really get that sense that, well, this makes sense. Um, Hence, we call ourselves a collective sense-making platform. So this makes sense to me as a human being because I can see how the argument evolves um, in that train of thought or in the system of thought. And I can see that this has been considered fully in a robust manner Because it's not just about the economic or the market forces or the technology, but it's also about the impact on human or the psychology of the human being and all of those added to the to the to the mix. And then when we when we with all of those inputs, when we start shaking and we come out with synthesis out of it, then it informs um, everyone of, you know, of all of the things we human beings know about it. It sounds like a, a very comprehensive approach. Um, I, I'm aware that there are many people listening who are probably very curious, who spend years being proud of being sort of up to date with with current affairs and, and the news. Um, and probably recently they've become quite exhausted. Um, they're probably aware that their sort of emotions are somewhat um, held hostage by algorithmic news feeds, and they're probably um, just exhausted by that process. So, if if you are someone a bit like that, and you're listening, you know, you can either sort of delve back into news, um, you can retreat and sort of complain about it, or you can try and do something about it. Um, if you're in the latter, um, you know, what would you recommend? I mean, how how do people sort of take part of in a, in a movement that's designed to ensure that we have more informed and calmer and more complex and nuanced discussions? But how can you? Because uh, I think people want to feel like there's something they can do. So, what mm. would you recommend? And that's uh, mm. my final question. Mm. Well, I would recommend joining. You know, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, uh, you are you know free to do so. Um, registering on hunom.com. And then find um, a thematic that's of interest to you, that where you want to add your perspective. Or if you can't find it, um, start your own. You know, mm-hmm. start building something that is a new thematic. And then you know, you will see others joining your thematic, but also you can invite other people to come and join you. So it's simple. It's really easy, um, but you know, it's structurally done in such a way that in a, in enables um, the end result to be um, a robust view um, to something that you're interested in. The other thing that it does is that instead of like those people who are actively even sharing, so they are on social media, they're sharing, that's exhausting. Um, and, and often it does not deliver back to most people. It doesn't like it, it delivers back to those with very loud voices for one reason or another. Um, and, and then those messages get repeated and over and over and over. But most people don't get that luxury of actually, you know, gaining things back. So if you are building on, you know, um, your what you share does not get. Uh, does not disappear. Doesn't does not go into some linear stream that you know goes away. But is part of that build. Um, and so you are putting your 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 thumb mark, so to speak, to the thought fabric of humanity, and it stays there. Um, and which over time then you know brings benefits to everyone who participates, who takes take, takes their so to speak old fashioned pen to paper, but <laughs> keyboard to the screen, I guess, <laughs> and um, and add value to the to the overall thinking. And uh, by the way, I, I really appreciate you mentioned this idea of of um, of ta- of um, like focus, or you know, you said something about that because I think. That's one of the things that the, the, the problems of this sort of mindless scrolling of stuff or 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 then we do in 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 sort of offline workshops we do things and then not everyone is heard and it's hard to engage people if unless they're in the same 
country and, and so on. So it's this idea of, yes, we can engage everyone, but in an environment where we focus and we take our time, we actually, you know, and, and sometimes people say, well, I don't have time, but, you know, the, 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 the speed with which you can build a better understanding is much greater than you would get in a workshop. You have to organize it, you know, you have to bring people together there and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, so it is faster um, and it is focused and it's, it's a counterpoint to this, uh, to this rush to give me the answer now straight away. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, it sometimes seems like we become addicted to, to things being easy and, and fast and actually lots of things are hard and slow and that's mm-hmm. okay. And mm-hmm. appreciating Absolutely. appreciating the depth of these things as well as the width um, mm-hmm. and acknowledging the ambiguity and uncertainty, I think is quite, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong, it means you're doing it right. Yeah, um, exactly. I, we, we could talk for a long time. I'm afraid we, we've sort of run out of time at this point. Mm-hmm. But uh, Dominique, thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. Uh, I really appreciate your views. Thanks, Tom, very much.